yeah, should be a lot of energy from all you guys. I think you will be warmed up in a while. Okay, so um, today's session, in case you're you know, still not a bit confused about the title, user experience for product managers, uh, does not mean that if you're not a product manager, you can't be here, but maybe understand a bit about the, uh, why is it important for a product manager to understand user experience, and maybe look at how the UX tools and artifacts can really help you around this. Okay. So what we'll cover today is a bit about the value of UX, um, discover how it's critical to your business, and learn to integrate UX data into your overall flow. Um, also maybe help to look at the overall um, business, uh, maybe some maybe um, objections to the process. Maybe you can share with me what objections you have heard and we can talk about it a bit. Okay, so at, originally this session is supposed to be a workshop that usually I run. I managed to compress it down to maybe about 40 minutes or even lesser if I can. If I talk too fast, anybody feels I'm going too fast, just raise your hand, I'll go a bit slower, but we have a bit of function on time. Okay, and Q&A at the end. Uh, what we will not cover today, obviously, is to be a UX designer. So if you are a UX designer in the room, you realize that there's, there's a bunch of things that you know, we probably can't cover in 35 minutes. So just be aware. Okay. Uh, introduction about my company, uh, we are the Collect folks, relatively young partnership of uh, three of us. Um, there is Lina, Ruth, and myself. We cover different areas. Uh, I cover all three in the training and the coaching that I do. Um, Lina does more product management and marketing, Ruth does more user research and marketing. And so when we do our coaching, actually our approach um, is fairly like in a very packed manner. Um, but myself, I started in tech, uh, computer engineer for NTU, went into agility kind of maybe the last six years uh, in terms of in the term of agility. I think I've always been agile, or like to think so. Um, and then I started user experience in, the, in one of the companies. <coughs> I worked in uh, quite a few roles over the last 16 years to reach a point whereby I feel that I want to coach teams and maybe help them understand more about the topic itself. Um, I worked with a fair number of companies in the region. Um, the early days, the big companies, uh, the later days, maybe a bit smaller. But I think iProperty is not small anymore. They are recently acquired by REA in Australia. Um, at Collect Folks, we work with a fair number of companies from startups until um, like SPH. Is there anybody from SPH here in the room? Maybe not. I think that's somewhere else. Um, and then uh, some Indonesian companies like KMK and Bokalapa. So it's like Carousel Indonesia, but I think 10 times bigger than them. Um, Fubu and SPH are uh, Design Studio and SPH, everybody think they know them. Last one is DMC, it's actually an energy market company I'm coaching right now. Um, having quite a bit of fun. Um, so our approach is explore, collect, evaluate, we use all the practices that we know, we work with people. Uh, work on the product team itself and understand them. Okay. So I'll jump into it. Um, so instead of an uh, introduction whereby we interact with each other, because I don't have enough time, maybe can I have a show of hand who is a product manager here? Just, just to get a sense. Who? Cool. So, great. Anybody who's a designer, visual UI designer, consider UI designer, any user researchers, I put a question mark because usually there's zero. Okay. Developer engineers are the rest, I would say. Anyone in QA? Business development? Those guys are like everything. <laughs> uh, marketing? None. Okay. So this is actually something that uh, this topic itself has evolved for me over the last two years. I delivered this in 2014 at the Agile Conference, maybe a slightly different version of it. Um, now it's a bit more refined. And I thought maybe before we start, uh, let's warm up, which is a perfect timing because Michael Chen has to change something for me. So you all stand up. Yeah. Someone suggested to me that we should all give each other a massage, but someone also mentioned that it may be uncomfortable for some people. So maybe just do a hands up, you know, in the air. Yeah. No one wants to do the pineapple apple thing, right? I don't want to do it. Not on camera. Yeah. And just yeah, let's breathe and go down. One more time. Up. I think we have to do this until the projector is <laughs> so, this may be a very good interactive 35 minutes of relax. Yeah. What guys? <laughs> I've never done before at a conference. Yeah. I run a conference for UXSG and uh, we give each other a massage. 400 people. It's a sight to see. Do you want to do that? Like, turn to your left. And just. Anybody feels uncomfortable about that? Yeah. yeah. No, no, just turn around, put your hands on the other person's shoulder and just give them a. Nice squeeze. Yeah. On the shoulder, on the shoulder only, please. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. If there's no one on your left or right, you know, don't worry. Okay. Yeah, turn around, turn around, turn around. Yeah. 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 So we did a warm up. Um, I'm going to get right into it. I'll move a bit faster. The value of UX. Uh, so those of you who are kind of new to product management, the reason why your product manager is part of team uh, and company ship the right product for your users. Uh, we live in a very complicated web, I think, product managers. Uh, I'm not a product manager trained, as I told you, I'm a computer engineer. I think most of the product managers here they didn't go to school thinking that they're going to become a product manager. They probably came through different paths, you know, engineer. You could have come from design, you could have come from business, you could have come from engineering. And then last year, uh, report to someone who probably doesn't understand anything about product, business, tech. Maybe they know more about business than you. Uh, but it's a very awkward position to be sometimes on this web, whereby you have no direct reports, maybe. You have very little uh, authority over the people, uh, and you have to influence them all the time. You know? So it's kind of a very weird position to be in. I personally find it very enjoyable. Uh, it's not politics, but it's really about understanding people, which is why I find the idea of doing research and user research uh, very important to my work every day. All right, so um, not written by me, but someone who has written this a lot, um, they put together a bunch of information about what a great product leader is. It's about the soft skills that you have. And besides that, a lot of technical skills that you need. So under technology, UX, maybe about life cycle, uh, processes. If you understand all these, I think you can be a really great product leader. I don't think in Singapore, at least, I've met many people who are a chief product officer yet. Uh, truly by title and even the work for the organization. Uh, still quite far away from that. Um, this morning, Mary mentioned Marty Hagen. For those who are not familiar with the name, uh, he runs SCPG, the Silicon Valley Product Group. A really good read about all the things that he's done. If you want to know how to be a great product leader, uh, advise me kind of like read almost everything that is written. Um, and what is UX? Um, the ideal guys, Tim Brown, wrote about business, people, and technology. So if you look back to this, very similar, right, to the broad owner. Very, very similar. And you kind of want to be in this sweet spot using all the different methods to do the work. I'll explain some of them. And ultimately, uh, most people, I think, confuse UX with UI, user interface. That's why I very specifically ask, are you a designer? And are you a researcher? I think there's a very big uh, gap in between all these skills that you need to do. And it encompasses a lot of the whole value chain in a product, a company, or a service that you provide. And so it's really a matter of people. Uh, usually at this point, I actually share an Apple video of the iPad, the first iPad that they released you know, about technology. It's a very beautiful video. Haven't watched it, you should probably go and find it and take a look at what it means to get to a point whereby you can get everything all synced up into one product that you can deliver. Right. So a lot about integration, getting all these bits all pieced together. And so I guess usually at this point, you'll see it's 10 minutes, it's actually the workshop. I've done the slides in a way that actually you can take this away. You can run this internally. You know, without me, you know the material. Just walk through, take all these activity slides and answer for yourself, um, what does it mean to have user experience within your company, your organization, and what challenges do you face today? I think we don't take enough time to actually sit down and write it out. Um, just taking 10 minutes of your time after this conference on Saturday, or maybe on Monday for those who don't work on the weekends. Um, just spend some time, write this out for yourself. You, know, you can answer a lot of things by yourself, and you can probably work out a nice little plan for you to be able to adopt UX in your organization. And so in terms of designing products, um, those who are you know, more experienced in the overall career, probably have designed all three in very different silos of physical products, desktop products and mobile products. And today, if you are kind of in a space where you do physical and digital, I think some people here do that, both physical and digital products, um, I think in the future, we talk about connected experiences, whereby we connect all these various aspects into one single chain. I think Apple probably represents the best of this. Uh, Google is trying to do this after, I think, they launched five hardware products. They want to tie everything that you do, you say, in the home into one big connected AI, you know, Skynet sort of stuff, one day. So again, if you think about what you think is a good user experience for a product, um, it's a good thought exercise for yourself, your company, and maybe even your competitors. Uh, to be honest, your competitors probably do something better than you sometimes. And I wanted to share maybe a positive experience that I have. I'm a cyclist. Uh, for those who know me, I'm crazy, I'm crazy about cycling. I do probably about two to 300 kilometers per week. Um, I'm crazy about safety also, about lights. Uh, this company in um, Ireland, I think so. Uh, they started the idea when they were in Singapore about how unsafe it was to cycle here. 
created a product on Kickstarter, uh, did the first version, created the version 2 of it. Now they are crowdfunded, both products, the company is crowdfunded <coughs> through the community, uh, and people love the product, you know, first, second, third, about quality. And so if you were to create um, products without user experience, you create very functional products. You know, people don't want to use them. But if you apply all design onto a product, all UX, no product management at all, you probably have delightful products that no one wants to buy. Um, so this is something that Mr. Perry shared. I think it's a very good read about what uh, it means. Right? So think about that. And if you think about contrasting a good user experience versus a bad user experience, uh, think about that for yourself. You know, what is a bad user experience? So again, back to fitness, cycling, this is supposed to be worn on an ankle. It looks a lot like the security <coughs> ankles that you wear kind of for after you leave uh, the jail. And unfortunately, they, they were a bit ahead of Fitbit at that time. Uh, didn't roll out a very good product. They kind of a bit shoddy. Um, both products that I just showed you, actually I'm a owner of them. I actually started both of them as a contributor. Uh, I don't use this anymore. It's just stuck there. Nobody likes it. Uh, on their own website, people don't like it and people don't use it. And no one gives a comment about it. Their customer service can't even bother to reply to them anymore because they know it sucks. They can't do anything more. So that's a very bad user experience. And now you get to see this on a stage in front of 80 people. Right? So that's how a bad user experience can create uh, very negativity. If you look at the responsibilities among a product manager and an effect designer, I personally feel there's a lot of overlap among the duties. And I think that it doesn't have to be I need to hire a UX specialist to do the work, or I need to hire a product manager specialist to do this type of work. I think a lot of people can learn these skills, especially those in between here. <coughs> Anybody here can turn to the person next to you and have a conversation. Who are you? How are you today? And do you like something about this product? Uh, whether you do a good job of the conversation, it's a matter of practice. If you know the technique, you understand all this, you can probably be trained. Um, and wireframes, user flow, you know. You don't have to have an engineering degree to draw a user flow. You can actually draw out how you think a user flow would like, at least, and then have a conversation about it. And so if you were to work together in a team or even by yourself, you start with requirements. But in terms of requirements, you probably want to define the users, the goals and the value. And look at looking at um, the product manager can own this acceptance criteria. So those who are familiar with Scrum or agility concepts or practices, you know, in Agile, as a product owner, ideal, so you can actually own this acceptance criteria very, very much. Okay. And in terms of user research, you are trying to understand the user needs and what they like about the technology or service. That means regular customer visits and interviews. Uh, this is a remote interview session that we do you know, through Skype. Uh, they are showing the screen here, and this is a researcher who is conducting the work uh, while we are on this project together. So in terms of ideation, uh, designers can facilitate the design process. Uh, Mary this morning talked about design sprint. Um, this is actually the example of design sprint. Uh, it was actually done in five days with this team in Jakarta. Had no idea how to do this, but they are very, very strong prototypers. They are very strong designers and very good product managers. They just haven't worked together in this manner before. We did one sprint with that. They took up so quickly that they now practice it for everything that they do in the organization. Um, I've seen them create and launch new products. They've applied it to their existing products. They have under the umbrella 22 product managers uh, with a vision of having 500 engineers in their organization at some point. I think it's a very powerful journey for them, uh, one year now, and they are interested to know and do more around this. And I don't have to be involved. I just taught them the framework. Uh, they went ahead and implemented by themselves. Now they do this naturally. And they have a very good setup. They have this round table that they can work together. So I get very nice pictures during the workshops. Uh, all the sketching that's involved, all the idea, ideation process uh, through this. And ultimately, I think it's about communication. Uh, so those of you who are product managers or maybe not product managers, you realize that the root cause of most issues, I think, is about communicating enough and in the right way. Uh, so we make sure that we bring in our stakeholders and share with them as much possible about the research that we've done on a regular basis, maybe every spring or every month, if at all possible, to give them an insight and build some empathy about the product itself. Right. And so if you were to say what is product managers versus how user experience is done. I think product managers can be responsible for the overall success, and UX designers are responsible for ensuring that user needs are met. Okay, next topic. I want to talk about maybe um, understanding how UX can be critical to your business and the ROI of it. Okay, it's not going to be very in depth. I'm not going to do any finance price modeling here. After lunch, there's no way we can sustain a finance model through this, not in a bank. Anyone here is in the bank? I always ask this question. Oh, 
very shy. Okay. Hi. Oh yes, I met you this morning. Um, and so, Janine Ray mentioned that integrating design into your company involves more than just hiring superstar designers. Uh, I wish we can hire superstar designers easily, but there's very few of them, even in Singapore or in the US. Uh, it takes a very long-term commitment to develop people, and this is like what I sincerely believe in working with so many companies, so many teams, uh, 102 companies that I work with today, that almost that you have to do a kind of a deep dive into people development before you can get a good design culture. And if you actually have that, uh, there's an institute called the Design Management Institute, uh, actually created this graph called DMI Design Centric Index to look at the S&P index versus companies who do this, Apple, Coca-Cola, Ford, Thurman Miller. Uh, if we were to remove Apple, this would probably be closer. Apple brings this up quite a lot uh, because I mean, they are the grandmasters of this now, but everybody's copying them. You know? can be Apple with a lot of effort, uh, if you can get there. But creating this sustainable competitive advantage is very, very difficult. It's not an easy task. I don't think you're going to walk away today or from this conference suddenly, magically, your companies are going to do that. Your CEO is not sitting in the room. Uh, your board of directors is not sitting in the room. They don't understand what UX is. Maybe if you tell them in some form yeah, after this, maybe you've got some chance to run maybe one little workshop by yourself with them. And that's really a very positive step. Uh, it took me four years to get my company to even want to hire the first user researcher. Uh, and that was under my budget, not someone else's budget. Okay. So if you were to look at the design maturity ladder, uh, you can plot your company into this. Uh, they didn't create this. There's a lot of maturity models out in the market. But I thought it would be nice to link you up to the same people who created the previous one. Uh, so if you are at no design, whereby design doesn't play any role in this product, service, or development, anyone here has this? Problem like you are here. <laughs> I will not say where you're from. Uh, stage two, design is only relevant in terms of style. It means you're all concerned about how pretty it looks. You know, that pixel perfect, rounded corner that you want in shaded blue or magento, whatever code that you need. And design is a process, integral to the development process. And finally, design is a means of encouraging innovation. You know, uh, most of the banks want to be here but they're probably somewhere here today. And so they're struggling to get there with a lot of coaches, a lot of consultants, a lot of hires, trying to figure out in a very fast time and burning a lot of cash to get here. Um, so it'll be interesting to watch. I think five tips you can have for building a corporate design culture, um, a vision, a strategy, leadership, good structure, that you can have some resources for success, a talent pool that's diverse in design, principles and deployed at key points of functional integration. Like Google actually did this very, very well. Uh, when they started, they were kind of like one integral department and they seeded everybody out as soon as they could. Right. So this is actually my strategy when I do any coaching or teamwork. Uh, we make sure that these are all in place and make sure that the talent pool in the company is ready to quickly seed out to as much of the company as possible. And obviously a culture that embraces all these dimensions of design and obviously change. That's why you're at Agile Singapore. Right. So perfect combination of these topics, that if change is kind of constant, having an agile mindset makes it easier to do this helpful. Okay. Um, if you think about what I just said, you know, direction, vision, strategy, if you want a company to be successful, uh, you need success to have direction and capability. If you want capability, you need to have competence and capacity. And if this comes through training, then this comes through the people's willingness to do it. So right now, the Singapore government, they love skills future. This is where they have the capacity to give you all the training that you want. Cap at $500, right? And so, competence is no matter how good we are, we still need all these skills. If you look at the product manager skill set, communication, skills, experience, information. And if you have the capacity for doing all this, you need people and you need to be efficient about it. Right? So this is actually something that I learned as I took up a COO role. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't learn this when I was a product manager, uh, but this guy, uh, David Norris, DC Norris, uh, he writes a very good blog about the topic. He has been a product manager, a VC, a COO in many capacities. I think this is a very good, uh, succinct way to explain for anything that you want to learn. Uh, you need to understand a strategy around that. And so that's why I like to talk about the UX strategy blueprint. Uh, most of you will be familiar with the business model canvas, a lean canvas. Uh, I like to make sure that we are talking about all this at the same table and not create a business model canvas for the sake of creating a very profitable business, but have no idea how to get there. Uh, if you want to combine design and bring it to the table, you need to be able to talk to the executive at the same level. 
right? You bring to them something that they can use, a one-page summary of what you think you can achieve. And hopefully you can tell them how much money you need to do this. So if you can identify what the challenges you have, uh, challenges you have, obstacles you are facing, look at aspirations that you have, you know, what is the ideal desired outcome? So in design, you don't design something for now, you design for something for the future. What is the outcome you want to achieve? And you look at focus areas, uh, which areas can you have the most impact? You look at guiding principles, how you overcome these challenges, activities that you can do, which is what I'm going to show you, maybe some of this in a while, and the measures you need to take. So it's a very comprehensive look at challenges, aspirations, focus areas, guiding principles, activities, and measurements. So this is a strategy that you put in place, you share with your team, everybody understands it, and let's go after you get budget approved. Or sometimes you can do it in a smaller way, you know, guerrilla style, get small budgets approved, like expense claiming out, and see what you can do with that. And so, if you were to get all this done, how do you get started? You know, this is probably why you're here. How do you integrate all these pieces into a flow, a story that you can tell people? Okay, so if we were to do a very traditional way of development, um, the guys at Additive Park with a very nice graph. In the past, I think most people started here, whereby they didn't uh, define the project very well, they did very little user research, and finally, when they get to the end, the cost to change their mind is very, very high. So probably if you're in a vendor arrangement, this is where change request number one, I'm going to bill you one mandate, two mandates, three mandates. What if you could change the equation whereby you define the project a lot through a design sprint, through the whole process of research, iteration of design, look at implementation, and finally launch. The cost to change your mind is a bit lower. Of course, this is a graph, the ideal case. Most people will have probably a wavy little blurred line, but hopefully around here instead of somewhere up here. Right. So, to achieve that, I think you need to kind of understand empathy. And empathy is not sympathy. You, you are not sympathizing with the person and feeling sorry for him. You are putting yourself in the frame of mind of that person. This is my team from KL. On their first visit uh, to Singapore trying to buy their MRT ticket, I decided not to help them. I'm a user researcher. After so many years of it, I like to observe people, what they do and how they do things. Uh, because it helps me understand that these four guys, solid engineers, eight years plus experience, can probably code the hell out of me. And these guys can't buy a ticket because the interface was designed for a very local person after 10 years of this product. Right? And when I went to KL, I had the same problem. I couldn't even put a coin into the machine. I had to get someone to help me because I couldn't read the damn label. Right? So I can understand and empathize with this. Uh, best empathy. And it's not, easy, it's not difficult to do, and neither is it easy to do if you have never done it before. To build empathy, you don't just think about it. You don't wonder about it. You don't just observe. You actually have to write things down as a collective, I like what Mary said today, as a collective, book this out. What do people think and feel? You know, what are they thinking and feeling? Assume this. What do they hear, see, say and do? What their pain and gains are of using our product? Really create this as a document that you can understand about the users of the product. And it can be also about the stakeholders. Imagine trying to try, write this for the CEO of a company. Try to create empathy map of the CEO of a company. You understand why he rejects your budget for doing certain things. Because he probably has some pain and gain when he rejects you, you know, about some things. And so it's not going to be easy to do this. You have to invite all your stakeholders, bring them to the table, ask these questions. What do you think about hope and fear? You know, I'm not going to run this through. The slides are going to be available after the conference. Uh, you can run this by yourself and really go through this. You can run this activity in your office. It's a 15-minute exercise you can do with your team members. You know, just for a designer, a product manager, Customer service, even better. I love working with customer service operations people. They can tell me way more about the product than anybody in the company. Okay. So bring them together. And if we have a kind of a very neat way to summarize, we can do this as a persona. Explain this in a way that we can capture this for other people to understand. And if a persona is kind of whereby you define the character, you define the scenario, and you give an idea of what the goal is for the people who want to work on this project. So if you want to bring a whole team together, you can't let the designer just keep verbalizing things out. You have to create material for them to read, let them understand and build empathy towards the product. And so if we have a lot of time, we'll create that. But you also can do this. This is drawn by my partner, when we're trying to create a cycling business. He told me he can't sketch. I told him you can. He did this. I think it's really good for a person who is a CEO, investor level guy, who has never sketched probably in his last 20 years. Um, so far, okay, you can do a statement level. You know, but I'm sure people in this room can probably do a better job. And you can walk them through the problem that the user is facing, the behavior and belief that the person is having, 
the type of demographic that you have within the user group and then the needs and goals for them in their product. But if you were to do all this you know, by hypothesis and you don't actually validate, you actually don't understand the user yet. So you need to probably do a bit of interviews. Um, instead of interviews, sometimes I like usually testing. Uh, it's a bit uh, easier way. You can ask people to do tasks in design, make sure that they have some chance to actually work on your product. And if you attended the eye tracking session today, it's a very similar session by Instead of eye tracking, we actually ask questions and facilitate uh, conversation about how they use the product. And we do observation on them. Okay. So how many to test? Uh, Jacob Nielsen wrote, uh, at least shared this thought in the past about five to test per personal group is good enough. We can cover 85% of the group. Um, and if you were to write more tests, obviously you are more reliable or you spend more time. It doesn't mean that you have more new results. Actually get the diminishing quality. Um, instead of doing a big test of 100 people, maybe do small bunches of 5 people over a period of time so you get all these insights into your team and feed into your mental cycle and feedback cycle. Okay. Um, what should you test? Um, so a lot of times when I ask people to do testing, they write very simple scenarios and you know, it's not a great scenario. I thought I would share you with some tips on how to write scenarios. Make the task realistic. So if the user goal is to browse a product offering and purchase an item, so people who go e-commerce, if you were to tell them, purchase a pair of orange Nike running shoes, no. This is all they will do. They are going to be stuck in their mind about how to do it. But give them the idea, a broad parameter, and let them explore. The key idea is to let them explore. Buy a pair of shoes for under $40. They are going to use a category filter. They are going to do some filters for price, hopefully. And that's when they get the test of system a bit. Make the task actionable. So if you were to say, for example, want them to find a movie at show times, you could say this very complicated line, and again, they will do exactly what you tell them, and you only see one result. It's either a fail or pass, or maybe some variation around it. But maybe tell them directly, go to this place, and then give them a chance to explore. Okay, so if you write a, the, the way you write a scenario is very important also. And avoid clues. If you have to look up grades, for example, for those with children in school, you have to see the results of midterm exams, go to the website, sign in. Again, very directive, you're telling them exactly what to do. Instead, Tell them, look up the results of midterm exams. They should know where to go if they are whatever school they are, right? You have to tell them which website to go. They should have an idea. Okay, so again, very easy exercise when you're back in your office. Write down two scenarios in which you test. Go back and look at the good and bad examples. Maybe you can frame them up. And if once you're done with all this, you know, how do you share information? I think product managers need to share all the work that you do. Um, and a good way to share is to actually look at the participants that you've done give a bit of a ranking, if they completed the task easily, all the way until they have a skip in the task, do everything up. So this is an old design that we did in the past, and we found there's a big issue here, a red line. So if you were to ask me, or ask any one of you, what should we fix? I think it's a very easy choice. Fix this. Right. So later on, when we did a new design, we fixed it. We saw that the results are good, everybody is happy, and we move on from that. No complicated A-B test or whatever. Just use it as thing. Get it done first and then you can A-B test the hell out of it. What can you do next? You can look at time to complete. So if time is an important aspect, especially in e-commerce, you want them to complete a certain task as quickly as possible. And then you get some rating about navigation, uh, usefulness, we we'll recommend. Uh, some people do MPS, the net promotion score. You can do this also in here. And kind of usability of search results. Uh, this is a bit hard because not everybody understands usability, even if they say they do. Uh, but Apple has trained a lot of people, so they kind of understand what it is. And so the last part I want to cover maybe is about objections. Um, usually at this point, I actually like to hear from you. Um, what are the objections you face in your organization when you are trying to introduce the process? For those that have done it before, how, how do you, you know, what did people say when you try to introduce the process? Anyone at all is wants to share? People that, uh, oh. people have the People have no time to participate in design research. Okay. We already know what our users want. How we already know what our users want. Ah, okay. That one is very easy to resolve. Uh, but let me share with you. I mean, when you want to introduce change like this, it's, it's very, very hard. The, the reason why I just want to share, uh, it took four years for us to get even to a point of wanting to do this. Uh, you were very lucky. The CEO wanted this idea. And I shared with him, you know, let's bring in some people to train us in this idea. How will we do it? The budget was put forward to him. Let's do it around 120k uh, sing dollars at that time. Uh, just a pair of coaches will help us through the journey. He said, nope, 
And I asked him, no, but you're the one who started the conversation. And you were the one who wanted it after you went to this fancy conference where somebody talked about UX in the, the new buzzword. And so what do you want to do? He said, find a cheaper way. So I found a cheaper way. I got a polytechnic lecturer to run one for us at one tenth price and went for the trade the trader model. Uh, we got everybody started conversing. So in this group here, there's about 50 people or 40 plus of engineers, designers, people with QA and all together, working together on this effort. Uh, so we answered them by doing very practical work. So five of us, like the GovTech guys, started the work, we shared the results, we brought people in the organization together and showed them that we can do this effectively in a very cost-effective way um, as long as they are willing to try. And once they saw the results, right, um, most of the time, they could see that they actually didn't know what the users were doing. They, had, they simply no clue. They were assuming, but they had no idea. So once we show this result, it's much easier to do it. Uh, but if change is hard, you need to talk to customers, get leadership on board. Bunch of stuff you can read, you want to move on. And if you're a product manager, you can really be in a position to listen, to be the voice of honesty and open-mindedness. Remember, you're in that little web, you have no authority, no direct reports. You can be this person that is fairly influential, uh, but yet you need to be open-minded about it. Be practical and collaborative. You know, if you have no budget, don't ask for hundred thousand dollars. Do it at a thousand. Use your expense slip. Get it done. Show the results. Move forward. Make it good enough, but no better. You know, you don't have to do a hundred thousand dollar full blown design research. You can do it five people at lunch. Talk to people for one week, and you get it done. You show the results that I showed you just now. Convince people to come on board. In test internally with people and get that information out. So develop personas, look at your stakeholders, identify your problem areas. So this is something that I did uh, with a client over 15 days. We ran workshops and understood what they were facing. Every single person wrote down if I can find the post about IT being slow and inefficient. When I asked them what it was about, uh, the main reason was that they were in three different countries, Australia, Singapore, and India. Uh, IT was in India, Australia and Singapore were business operations and marketing. And they kept coming back to IT is very slow. So I asked them, you know, what exactly is the problem? How can we solve this? When I examined every one of these activities, uh, it was a very simple solution. It was about communication. The solution was Skype. It cost them 15 10 days of my time to tell them to use Skype. And the founders didn't realize this because they never bothered to research their own employees. They never bothered to think about their own employees that they had problems they needed to solve. And Skype is a very free solution, I think. You can do premium Skype, you can do group video calling, but that's all you need. Obviously, after this, we did a lot more work to help them uh, and eventually streamline overall processes. And if you think about how are you doing projects today, if you are here in a rare waterfall manner whereby you kind of work in this environment, it's probably going to be very difficult to insert this mindset into it. Maybe you need to move yourself somewhere here, understand how to work in this method, and maybe move yourself to a point whereby product ownership is about understanding the product for business and stewardship for the users and work in a very integrated team manner. And if you put everything together, running workshops, maybe do yourself or hire a dedicated person, you can probably reach a point whereby you have a table full of people who are all doing the same thing at the same point in time, having the same mindset about how to solve the problem. Right, so if you define, define your own product uh, design process, we did this before Google did the GV stuff. We call it a design sprint today. We call this something we drew on the wall that we all like. So it's a design process, we all discuss as a team. It's not five days, it's not 10 days, because we're not as good as a GV team yet. But we could get this done at a certain time frame. We put everything together into what we call a ballroom. Every artifact is in a room, everyone is discussing the same exact item that they put together and get it done. Uh, some of you will be saying, you know, man, I don't even have a meeting room bigger than this. I don't have a meeting room enough for my meeting today. How do I do it? Anywhere that's open in your environment, a wall, face it up, let people see it. This is what I'm doing. I'm not spending hundred thousand dollars. I'm spending maybe all, all I'm spending is my time to help you understand. The and if you set up a product roadmap, help people understand that a roadmap is not about just the product, it's about the company and departments you're affecting. That is product design, tech, operations, marketing. Uh, we didn't have sales, we just sales and marketing. Give them an idea of who is going to be impacted by the work that you do. And you can have people understand that if you focus on delivery, you can bring UX into the conversation. So ultimately remember that all these artifacts that I've shown you and all the activities that I'm doing is about creating a conversation. Um, this is a wall we created in a design screen. This lady here was a user from one of the customer service guys. Uh, this was held on a different floor. She walked up and just stood there and asked questions about this product. 
She had no clue what was going on, but she could ask questions in a meaningful way. And the engineer here, and this, uh, actually he's a designer, uh, really saw a different point of view. And when he does design after that, it's a very, very different composition that he's having. Okay. So a recap, what we covered today, the four points, the guy is telling me to end, which is just perfect. Okay. So great books you should read. I like this too. Uh, it's about psychology. Probably doesn't fit in a Belgian conference, but you'll be interested that these are probably the best books you could read uh, in your whole career. Uh, I, do, I use a lot of tools, Google Docs, I favor that because it's collaborative. Uh, prototyping, there's many tools that I use, and there's a bunch of tools for visual design and usability testing. Um, again, if you want to do a follow up, let me know. Usually, when I run a workshop, I actually ask people to write down all the activities they've done and think about in 30 days can they actually do it. Um, so far, not a single person that I've done a workshop with actually can follow up. The number one reason they give me is yes, no time. Uh, that's a very lazy excuse. I think that has no time. To me, if you're here sitting there for 30 minutes and you're not dozing off, you have time. It's a matter of whether you want to spend the time uh, to improve the product for your company and for your users. Right. So, if like any good product manager, I will ask for a retrospective. Uh, if anybody wants to do it later on, I'll be here. You will do a quick circle and you can tell me what you like, what you didn't like, and what you'd like to see more of this. So Q&A. This is actually an example of a workshop that I run uh, at General Assembly. So I do public courses and I do in-house kind of work. So this is a public course. Everyone here is a, not a product manager. I think the closest product manager was this guy who runs a very big music group. I was very surprised why the director of product was sitting in my room understanding UX. But I think they had fun. I hope. So thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions? Hi. Sorry, in your slides, uh, you <laughs> in slides you show that uh, there are two formula points direction equal to region class. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. And then the other formula is um, I can't remember this. Um, I'm standing on a stage and I can't remember, so don't worry. Yeah. And then uh, using times, what was the difference? I, I, I think probably this is the question. Oh, that's a valid question. Ah, so I think you're the first person who has asked me a question about this. I've shown this so many times, I'm quite surprised. I'm going to ask them. But which one do you want to ask about? I want to understand what is the difference between class and times. Class and times? Yeah. See, uh, direction equal to vision class region. Okay, so I kind of understand yeah. it's vision class region. Okay. I have also. And then success equal to direction yeah. times capabilities. You're asking about the operator, why do you use that? Ah, yes. uh, unfortunately, I'm not this guy, so I don't know. But I'm just sharing the idea of what he's sharing. and. Um, Basically, what he's trying to share is like success in direction and community, and he broke it down for you. Community is these ideas, and competence is this, capacity is this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Take a read at this article. It's probably going to explain it much, much better than me. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Sorry. 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 What's the difference between, because when I come in, uh, I saw these uh, product owners yeah. use experience for yeah. product owners. Yeah. Uh, but you're using product manager, yeah. and then you're also using product leader. Yeah. So is it interchangeable? So I guess you can just say product person refer. Uh, product owner is a term used in Scrum. Uh, okay. Product manager is used, it's a term used in pretty much all in the industry. Nobody uses the word product owner usually. Uh, if you ask the more traditional guys, they all start with product manager. And even product manager in different companies can mean different things. So if you work in cosmetics, I was product manager in a cosmetics firm. Everyone thought I was creating a product like perfume. Actually, I don't. I'm actually the technical product manager. Okay. And so it's very confusing. So I kind of like, you know, just do product. Be a product person. Okay, sure. Thank you. As for HR, <laughs> I don't think it changes your salary very, very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Oh my God.